Okay, I'm going to start with one of my favourite drawings by the artist David Shrigley. Um, according to the philosopher Arthur Danto, something is a work of art if, one, it has a subject, our inevitable death. Two, it projects some sort of attitude um, or project in regard to the subject. Three, it does this by means of rhetorical ellipsis. By this he means that the viewer themselves has to fill in the missing piece of the puzzle. And four, the work of interpretation on the part of the viewer requires background knowledge. The dad in Trigley's drawing knows his art history well enough to see the severed head in the box as a bloody brilliant work of art. The kid is left completely bemused. This encounter with the work of art nicely illustrates what Ingold calls the retrospective orientation that dominates theories of material culture, which starts from the already made object and works back to the ideas, the meanings and the social functions that, this object, or that these objects embody. Creativity becomes framed within this perspective as a kind of internal labour in the mind, in the imagination of the artist. My issue is not with Danto's definition of art per se, but with a retrospective indifference to the work and friction of making with materials. My research, I'm an anthropologist, by the way, not an archaeologist, so, um, yeah. Um, my research is interested in contemporary art in the making. Um, I worked for a year as an assistant alongside three sculptors. Three sculptors, um, three sculptors, Ruth Hodgins, Douglas White and Alexander Engelfrit, who all made work with clay. Raw, raw clay mainly, but they also fire their work to ceramic. This is Douglas White's work with raw clay, raw clay and hessian, and this is a solo show we installed in Amsterdam. Um, and some of the ceramic sculptures that we made together. Um, my interest in this paper is to develop a few um, speculative reflections on my experience with these artists. Um, looking at their sculptural, seeing what their sculptural practices with clay, um, what, they, what, they've, what they've got to say to a material culture orientated towards substances rather than objects. I'm going to begin with the work of Alexandra Engelfried and her work with plastic clay um, and then move on to a few reflections on the process of learning how to work with clay in relation to fire. Um, I was going to oh, I was going to show a video but I didn't make sure the link worked it doesn't matter I'll just leave it on this so this is from a project that we did together in France um, called Trench Tranché um, which we then built a kiln round and fired into ceramic but I'll come back to that um, in the right balance with the water clay becomes what Gaston Bachelard calls part the perfect earthen matter in this state clay invites the playful dynamic coupling between material hand and head, which for Lambrus Malafuris marks the relational achievement <coughs> of a material agency that serves as a bridge between a plastic mind and plastic culture. Anyone who has laid hands on clay will have a sense of this plasticity that sets clay apart from other materials. Described as a true mud person, Alexandra Engelfried works with a whole body her feet, knees, hands and elbows prodding, turning, sliding, pushing, hitting, digging into this material. Her work leaves a profound, visceral, unspoken sense of relation of both body and clay, giving and receiving, forcing and suffering. Here I'm quoting from Alexandra. When starting to work, I don't have any preconceived ideas about the result. I open myself to the material and process and the work develops through the interaction between me and the clay. In this relational sense of practice, the agency of the maker becomes decentered, situated in a negotiated process of making itself. This is Alexandra speaking again. Clay has, been clay has been essential to this way of working. I don't know any other material from which you can work from or with with such a degree of uncertainty as clay, except maybe drawing. Clay has this transformative aspect. It stands for matter from which everything arises and from which everything returns, and to which everything returns. But at the same time, the material lets itself be formed. It can take shape, be imprinted, show traces. It can, take, it can also take over and express feelings, often feelings you didn't even know you had. 
Plastic clay has been a constitutive partner in the development of Alexandra's practice, not just in what pl plastic clay affords her practice as a sculptor, her doing as a sculptor, with its ability to take on any shape imaginable, but with the quality of undergoing possible with this material. Yeah, so just to quickly go through this, we, we, put, we built a trench, dug a trench, about 20 tonnes of clay was put in, and then we built um, a kiln around it, fired it over 10 days into ceramic. Um, this was the finished piece a year later, which you can walk through, up, up, and, up and through. Um, I'm going to move on to another, another project I worked with her in the Briqueterie Museum, in an old brick factory in Cyril le Noble in Burgundy region of France. Um, and it was preparing for, for a performance with a musician um, at bars, a Dutch musician. Um, and for 10... Yeah, we worked, Alexandra and I worked together to turn 25 tonnes of raw clay, dry clay, delivered straight from the quarry, um, into workable clay. Every day, Alexandra and I would take off our shoes and socks and step in and tread and knead the clay, gradually working the water into its body. It's consistent, consistency changing from a dry chalk through to lumpy cottage cheese through to a heavy paste like set in concrete. Every morning would take an act of will to overcome my resistance, to take the first step into the clay, to get bogged down in its viscosity, its way of turning my every movement against itself. But on the last day of its pressing, the clay underwent its final transformation. From a thick paste, earth and water suddenly seemed to emulsify, to turn fatty and unctuous, slippery instead of sticky, both wonderfully yielding and playfully resistant in this yielding. I had spent the last two weeks knee, sometimes thigh deep in the clay, but this was the first time that I actually moved into the clay itself with my whole body, caught in a wary hesitation between fear and invitation playing with the mud, with a sensation of mud against my body, the way movement and touch, doing and undergoing, alternated together. There seemed no end to the possibilities that Claire afforded. Over the months of fieldwork with Alexandra and other artists, I got a good sense of this material, um, a practical grasp of the possibilities it afforded, different ways of making. But for a moment that afternoon, it felt as if there might be no end to the process of opening up into the clay, to the unnerving, joyous sensuality with which it overwhelmed experience. Tim Ingold takes issue with the way agency, as an analytical move to give back power to non-human constituents of the lived-in world, reads back from action to a putative cause in the thing itself. The agency possessed by humans, by non-human animals, plants, microbes, materials, he argues that this emphasis on agency gets things back to front. Humans, he says, do not possess agency, nor, for that matter, do non-humans. They are rather possessed by action. In this way, clay is not material with certain properties, but a material composed in the diverse movements of its multiple constituents. The animacy is not one of a singular unified material, but a composite earth and water in ongoing relation in an environment that is itself always changing. In its submission to the pressing foot or the forming hand, clay's formlessness, or formfulness, affords the hand its form-giving and world-disclosing capacities. It is, to use Heidegger's phrase, eminently ready to hand. This remarkable plasticity of clay underlies much of his co-option within the everyday and not-so-everyday life of people around the world in the focused action of making pots, figurines, tokens, ovens, houses, mosques. The temptation within a discipline like anthropology is to focus on the empirical evidence of everyday social life, to circumscribe the qualities, the materiality of substances by virtue of their incorporation into a characteristic pattern of day-to-day -day activities. However, in its animacy, clay offers not just a passive but active resistance to our practices of making with them. It has a temporality and a, life of, and a life of its own that acts upon us, in and through us. The plasticity of clay names a wondrous mollification, that's from Gaston Bachelard, that invites the play of the hand and the heart, amplifying and intensifying the experience. The focused action of skillful practice cannot be understood, I argue, outside a relation 
to a more expansive, much less reasonable material imagination that overflows the bounds of voluntary action and frays the edges of established forms of social and practical life. The imaginative life of working of making with materials is caught up not just in an economy of will and mastery and skill, but also subject to a wilder ecology of grace. Speaking from his quite different sculptural practice with clay that nevertheless shares this same element of not knowing at its heart, the other artist, Douglas White, that I work with, described his practice like this. My own will, my own position in the world is not transparent to me, and that is what art making is for me. It is this idea that you think you're investigating the world, but in fact, but in fact you're investigating yourself, or even that the world is investigating you. The knowing of sculptural practice resides in the relation itself, in the unfolding process that takes the knowing subject beyond themselves, beyond what they know. In their different ways, the sculptural practice of the artists I work with can be understood as what Foucault calls a technology of the self, those reflective, and here I quote from Foucault, those reflective and voluntary practice by which men not only set themselves rules of conduct, but seek to transform themselves, to change themselves in their singular being, and to make their life into an oeuvre that carries certain aesthetic values and meets certain stylistic criteria. In an orientation to substances, material culture becomes less an expression of cultural and social life in material form than the transformation of the self and the social and the social through materials. I'm going to... There's Alexandra during the performance. How long have I got left? Seven minutes. Seven minutes, okay. Um, The transformation from clay to soft sediment to stone is the work of fire. More specifically, the work of fire at at the intensity made possible by the pyrotechnology of the kiln. The earliest ceramics on earth is a bit of archaeology, and you have to tell me if my use of it makes any sense at all. The earliest ceramics unearthed in the caves near the, the village of Dolni, Dolni Vestanici in the Czech Republic have been dated to about 27,000 years ago, 20, 26,000 years ago. Fragments of thousands of figurines of animals and humans litter the site. I've got, these are some of the figurines. Fragments. Thousands of figurines of animals and humans litter the site near the kiln in which they were fired. And here I quote from um, Prudence Rice. On the basis of their experiments, the researchers believed that the ancient artisans fired the objects while still wet. And the entire procedure was designed to thermally shock the items, causing them to steam, to sizzle and explode, perhaps for ritual or divinatory purposes. In the fierce heat of the kiln, water turns to steam, the expansion violently cracking the clay it finds itself in. But this intense heat also transforms the clay into ceramic. From the archaeological evidence, it seems that these ancient artisans didn't develop any further use for this new material. The find predates by many thousands of years the earliest evidence of pottery. The earliest obviously functional use of this new material In the obscurity of their purpose, these figurine fragments seem to thumb their nose at the usefulness of pots and bricks, and the place this this usefulness has held in theories explaining the origins of ceramic technology, and bear mute witness to the magnetic power of transformation itself, transmutation itself, the riddle it poses to to prospective sense and sensibility, to imagination and understanding how it speaks to a curiosity of engaging with substances in this metabolic sense, made visible through fire. In the transformation into ceramic, clay is given over to the kiln. Concealed in its flames, this metamorphosis takes place out of reach of sensible perception. This interval sets into tension a relation between uh, before the fire and, and its after. Opening a kiln is a moment full of anxiety, what will the journey through the fire have done to objects once familiar now turn strange? This anxiety is the measure of the uncertainty, the indeterminacy of the change that takes place in the kiln. Holding a bowl, still warm from its passage through the fire up to the light to catch a play of colour and texture on its surface is to come face to face with a little. <coughs> what happened here? This bowl 
was the first that I fired during my field work with a sculptor Douglas White, a little experiment that turned out surprisingly well. I've tried many times to recreate this glaze during the residency, to, to recreate the russet tones, um, <coughs> but failed every time. Not knowing any better, I jotted down the vaguest of recipes, leaving out so many details of its making that their absence had proved to be vitally important. The riddle posed by the clay's metamorphosis into ceramic is how to ensure, is how to, how to, how to return the, sorry, I'll start that again. The riddle posed by clay's metamorphosis into ceramic is how to ensure the return of its unexpected gifts. So it's not just making a glaze once, it's to try and make it again. That's the really difficult bit. I joined Doug during his res res residency at the European Ceramic Work Centre, um, a research institute in the south of the Netherlands. We were there to learn about working with clay and with fire and to learn from the ceramic tradition embodied there. Embodied in its architecture, its electric and gas kilns, its equipment, <coughs> its meticulous sourcing, storage and labelling of materials, the knowledge and curiosity of its technicians, a community of practice orientated towards making sense and making certain of this material and its transformations. In the productive uncertainty of its transformations through fire, clay invites and repays this attention. It reframes materials and the processes of their extraction, processing and mixture as open questions. We know nothing about a body until we know what it can do, as Deleuze Guattari talk about the body in all of its forms. The patient, through, we know nothing about the body until we know what it can do through the patient work of trial and error, improvisation and careful observation. To paraphrase Isabel Stengers, there is always more to the world than first meets the eye. It is in this metabolic sense of materials facilitated by fire that really fascinates me. A desire to go beyond the superficiality of recognition to accompany something invisible to its unanticipated conclusion. That's from John Berger. The metamorphosis of clay through fire draws attention to the extent to which our world has been transformed by a fire yoked to human modes of production and sociality. While much of the literature on the hearth emphasises fire's capacity to gather in familial and communal life. A focus on kilns and forges serves to foreground fire's centrifugal power. That is, it's the metabolic power that produced the kilns, the plaster, the concrete, the metals, the plastic, through, through which material cultures growing divisions and differentiations have been made material. Pine and Clark and Yusuf in their 2014 paper amongst others, have made important moves to bringing this metabolic orientation to understanding, the material, to, un to understanding material culture. And I'm speaking here in terms of anthropology and, soci and sociology to a certain extent, less archaeology. Um, but I think this is a field, field of research that's still very much in its infancy. Yeah, I'm